Ladies and gentlemen, it's your main man, Double O, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Turning Music Into Money. Today's show will be about should I pay the DJ? And I am so honored to have this platform. I would like to thank Miss Ruby for this great platform on Legacy A100. I'm so thankful. I am so thankful. Thank you so much, Miss Ruby, for seeing something in me that I did not see in myself. But today's guest, will be none other than the teacher of Outkast's first DJ, Mr. DJ. His name is DJ Power Lord. DJ Power Lord, welcome to turning music into money. Thank you for having me on. Man, it's, it's, it's such a great pleasure, my man. I mean, you've been a, a DJ, a uh, promoter, a mentor to other DJs. You started magazines, record company owner. Um, and, and, and so much more, man. What is your favorite part of the game, man? You, just tell me. In all honesty, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's a really a hard question to answer because there's so many parts that I love. But I'm going to have to say, if it's from the DJ perspective, it's getting and hearing new music. Okay. Okay. That is the biggest thing that I love. I, from the DJ aspect, I, every time I see a new project that I wanted, <laughs> mm -hmm. just so I can hear it. You know. See what I what I want the listeners to understand. Um, DJ Power Lord is 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 very versed in Atlanta music history. We are going to get into that. I have a couple of questions that I want to ask um, before we get into the history because we need to know our history. I'm a very um, avid believer of we need to know our history in order to know where we're going because I, to I totally believe that the music industry is made up today of a little bit of the past, a little bit of the present, and definitely uh, we're trying to mix into the future with uh, just trying to see where we're going, and, and we don't have a definite direction just yet, but um, we would learn more if we listen to, to uh, the people that lay down the foundation, and we're definitely going to get more to the history, but I kind of want to get into some questions I have for you, man. Um, what I want to know is, what made you even want to get into DJing? I know you started DJing in 1986. So what made you even want to, to be a DJ? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for that question to be answered, I have to go further back than 86. Okay, okay. Uh, when I was in second or third grade, we're talking about like 1976. Mm-hmm. I wanted an album, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and it was a uh, Bootsy's Rubber Band uh, player. I think it was called Player of the Year album. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted that album more than anything in the world, mm -hmm. and of course, for me to get it, which I guess is a good, a good moral principle that my parents gave me, it was if you want it, you got to save your money to get it. Mm -hmm. Now I'm too young to be really getting an allowance. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so what I did was to get this at the money for this album. I was at, best way to put it, I was getting pimped out by the people in my neighborhood because I would like rake leaves or grass for like fifty cent, and you know, or cut grass for fifty cent, wash mm -hmm. a car for fifty cent, hustling, hustling. <laughs> you know, so I was doing all that to buy this record, and it took all summer for me to get the money. To buy this record, you talk about this, an album only costs like six dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it took me all day near all summer to get this money up to get this album, and I did. Cause so my, I had this love for music early on. Okay. And and I had that work for it. So, and I always wanted to be in the music industry, but I didn't have any talent. <laughs> okay, as a kid growing up, I said, "Look, I didn't have any talent. I couldn't sing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't. Uh, 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 even though I played." Uh, the trumpet. I played the trump. Uh, uh, I played the trumpet. I played the uh, tuba. I played uh, the baritone. I can read music and I can play music, but I couldn't create music. Okay. So that means I had really no talent, which a lot of artists they don't understand when they don't have talent. <laughs> so you understood that at an early age. Right. That I didn't have the talent to be an artist. Mm -hmm. So somewhere. Around Fresh Fest two or three, I can't remember <laughs> right mm -hmm. now. Whatever it was in '85, when it came to Atlanta, I went to that was the first rap show I ever went to. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm sitting there watching this rap show, you know, uh, like I said, I don't remember who I was on it, but I know Curtis Blow was on it. I definitely know that. Okay. That boy. But anyway, I'm watching this show, and I'm like, there's no band. There's no, <laughs> you know, no, there's no musicians. There's this guy just playing records. So guess what? What's I think that? I can do that. <laughs> mm. I think I can play records. Mm-hmm. Never realizing that not only is the DJ the most important part of the show, especially at that time, because they were, you weren't talking about track acts. Mm-hmm. You weren't going off, the, off, a, off a dat tape or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, this is live. So the DJ controls the whole show. He's the most important part. And the rapper is not important. It's the DJ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So with that being the case, anyway, I knew I didn't have talent, nor did I know what talent. You know, I'm like, I can go get me a couple of record players, and I can, and I can play records like anybody else. Mm-hmm. And that's where, and that's where it started. And so, I learned, and I ended up learning that it was a lot more to it than just that. So, you, it just really came from the love. It came from the love and the desire to just really want to be, um, with music in some form or fashion. So, let me let me let me find out what's the what's the mindset. Of a of a of a DJ because I know you're a purist, man. You you are a pure hip hop head. So what is the mindset of the DJ uh, to even want to be a DJ? Like, is it is it for the money? Is it for the culture? What's the mindset? I think that's an individual call. Okay. <laughs> I can't really say. I can only say what what motivated me. Mm-hmm. And outside of the love of being of wanting to be in the music business and not knowing how to get in the business. Mm-hmm. I saw this as my route in. Okay. But once I started DJing, uh, like I say, we all start uh, we all start the same place in our bedrooms, you know, okay. or, or or a room in our house, mm-hmm. you know, and you know you progress from you know you from from that to maybe doing somebody's birthday party, to doing somebody's uh, you know school dance, to eventually getting to you know back then getting into an apartment clubhouse and inviting different. Schools, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a progression. It's always mm-hmm. a progression to the next thing. Um, but once I got out there and I saw that just by the, the music I chose to play, that I could influence people in many ways, not just to dance, but I, but I mean, I'm going to give this as the best example, and I'm, I'm going to keep it as clean as possible. When Two Live Crew came out with the song, we want some mm-hmm. here's work, mm-hmm. okay? It was my crew that broke that record in Atlanta, mm. okay? No one played that record in Atlanta before we did. Now, now I want to get more to what you just said, breaking the record, because this show is about today is about should I pay the DJ. Now, when you broke that record or your crew broke that record, did the money come from the artist or did it come from the record label? to fund the street team? Neither. Okay. Neither. In that particular case, quite literally, I had a partner of mine, because I'm, I'm in high school, mm-hmm. and he was from Miami. Okay. He came He came to this party that we were having on Old National Highway. It's a holiday in on Old National Highway. Okay. And he comes up to me and he says, Horace, I just came back from Miami. This is the hottest record going down goes, you've got to play it. And we played it in that party that night, unheard. Mm-hmm, <laughs> okay? mm-hmm. And by the time that second chorus comes around, everybody in the room is chant, chanting the, 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 the chorus. Mm. Okay. So quite literally, we had a party that, that, that Friday night. Mm-hmm. That, you know, uh, come by that Monday, we got people coming up to us. Uh, you know, in school, and we all went to basically different schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming up to us, saying, "Hey, that 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 record y'all played, that two live record y'all played, or that record, uh, you know, da da da, that y'all played. Can y'all get that to us on a mixtape?" Mm-hmm. And that was back when we literally made mixtapes. Mm-hmm. You know, and then it got to the point where, within by the end of that week, it was, "Can we just get the song not mixed, just by itself?" <laughs> mm. So we quite literally broke. That record. So, I think, and, I, and when I say that, I'm saying that in the aspect we broke that record, as you want to say, for free in that party within that week because it didn't come to the record pool. As you as you're doing my my uh, 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 
Your bio. Resume. Mm-hmm. Right. Resume bio. That I was a million dollar DJ, which is the million dollar record for, and not everybody could be a million dollar DJ. Did you guys take money? Did you guys take money to no. be a DJ? So no. what, where, where did the money or where does the money come when, when you're talking about DJing? Uh, once again, it comes from the aspect of what, of what you're looking at. Um, money could come from the, from the parties or where you're working, however you, you're working. Okay. So back then, no, no, there was nobody walking up to us, giving us money to, to, to uh, make a mixtape or to play a, a record in a party. Nobody was doing that because at that time, everybody was – the people that was in the business were all R&B people, and R&B people didn't do that. Mm. There was no such thing as a street team. In fact, the street teams is a hip-hop creation, which, which is called guerrilla marketing. Okay. <laughs> okay. So – Quite literally, we chose what records we played if, by the way, it sounded if we liked it. Mm. Mm. You know, so those so, parties is where we got our money. So it was totally for the love of the culture and pushing the culture forward, and not the money aspect of it. Exactly. Okay, so so just I just want to fast forward a little bit. In today mm-hmm. in today's world, should in your opinion, should an artist pay a DJ? to get played in a club? Should they? Yes. No. But do they have to? Yes. Because the game is just that corrupted. Okay. Okay. So do you think there are any DJs out here that are working prominent clubs that are just doing it for the love and won't take your money and, and, and to spin your music and, and to try to break your stuff? I'm going to say if it is, I have it better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And when I say that, I'm going to go back to when I started promoting records or even when I started my record label. Okay. There were some DJs, yeah, I had, you know, we had to pay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, how much we money are we talking? How much money are we talking? Back then, you know, you, if you like, I'll be saying, if you went into a strip club, mm-hmm. that's the best way to put it, you had to know the vices of the DJ. Okay. And, with, and when I'm saying that, you have... You have three things, which really four things, and I've stated it on other things that people and people laugh about it. You, when it came to breaking records, you either had payola, mm-hmm. drugola, <laughs> sexola, mm-hmm. and there's also a thing called plugola. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. But we just called them the three olas because most plugola really doesn't come into in the play, in this situation. But you had to know their vices. Some DJs, all they wanted was. You know, for you to buy them a couple of drinks. Mm-hmm. So that's that's literally, uh, excuse me, that's payment. Mm-hmm. Some, you know, they want you know they want to smoke some weed or you know, or, or snort something or pop something. Mm-hmm. So you you provided that in some way or another. So that's payment. <laughs> mm. You know, and some, you know, yeah, they won't just straight up. Hey man, give me you know, give me say fifty dollars. You know, like go pay this girl just to go dance to your record. You know, uh, another twenty or another thirty. Mm-hmm. You know, so you could pay for four hundred dollars. You might you might just break your record. But it, that was that's the game. So you've never taken money yourself personally to break a record. Not to break a record, no. Mm, so <laughs> that that's that's unheard of. Uh, exactly. <laughs> that's unheard of. Now, how does a DJ? I guess negotiate getting paid. I guess with the club owner or whoever is taking care of the DJ. How do they? How do they go about negotiating your fee? Because you have to make a name for yourself, I'm sure. And you know that's another question. How do you go about making that name and negotiating your price? As a DJ? Yes. Like back then. Back then. Okay. Back then. <laughs> back in the day, and we're talking about late '80s, early '90s. Mm-hmm. As I said before, everything came from a progression. Like I say, you started in your bedroom when nobody was listening to you. Then you pass out some tapes to your boys, or you know, your you know, some folks you your friends. Mm-hmm. They pass some tapes around. You know, you get that high school, you know, that birthday party. You get that uh, 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 high school dance. You get, you know, you eventually make enough name noise in the streets that you you can rent a apartment house, clubhouse. 
you know. So mm -hmm. all along, you're building your name. It's pretty much all you're doing is marketing. Mm -hmm. It's not you're doing marketing, and you know, and the best uh, 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 way to market your name back then, you know, before it made, you know, was through either the tape that you were that that you were selling to people or giving to people, um, or you threw a, a, a hype party that had a lot of girls. Got you. Because everybody was, all the guys want to be where the girls are. Got you. Got you. So you built your name, and you eventually worked your way up into, like, say, it be it a, a club gig, you know. Be it a, a club gig could be anything from a skating rink, a dance club, a teen club, any place where people played music. Mm hmm And you got a job. You, you fill out applications, you got a job. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, I, I read in your bio where you were a club DJ, mm -hmm. and it eventually became uh, Sharon Showcase, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you were in that club, what was the, I guess, was a lot of, was a, was a lot of music broken then, back then, like when you were in that club? Did you, were you responsible for breaking a lot of music back then? But by the time... By the time that Sherry Showcase became, it's, yeah, I'm gonna say effective, I was no longer a DJ in the club. Okay. <laughs> at that point, but I will say this: Sharon Showcase, when it comes to Atlanta music, mm -hmm. <laughs> in basements or southern music, they were very influential. They mm. were very influential. I mean, you did, you was not a in a rap group, period, mm -hmm. in Atlanta, and didn't try to play. Sharing showcases stage, period. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if you because literally Sharing Showcase was would, would be the unofficial hip hop Apollo of the South. Mm. If, mm. You, if if you could get those people in Sharing Showcase mm -hmm. to like your music and dance to your music and want to put you on that stage, you had a hit record, you were a hit group, and everybody that from that era became stars. Everybody. Mm, so let's let's get into a little bit of uh I just want to touch a little bit on the on the new school right now and then we're gonna jump back right back into the history of this thing. But DJ Khaled, what do you think about what he's done, what he's doing to be able to uh monetize everything that he does? What do you what do you think about that and do you think he's transforming uh the, the the lifestyle of a DJ or the mindset of a DJ. Oh, most definitely. They the DJ today of the let's say of a uh, Caleb or even the, those cats that get to get, get to play out in uh, Vegas. Mm -hmm. They have resurrected DJ. Mm -hmm. Cuz at one point in time, you couldn't uh you know, the DJ was getting phased out of hip hop all yeah. the way around. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and these guys have 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 come to have brought it back to the point where they are the star, and the rapper really needs them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now that's my thing too. Now back back in the days, was it proper protocol for a DJ to pair with the rapper to order to help build their name up, or did the did the rapper go out and seek the DJ? Like how did that how did that relationship work? Okay. To understand that question, you have to go back to history. Okay. okay, okay. You have to understand the basic formation of hip-hop, mm -hmm. okay? And, then, yeah, and you have four tent poles that hold up hip-hop, mm -hmm. okay? Graffiti, DJ, break-in, mc mm -hmm. Those are your four tent poles of hip-hop. Those are the core cornerstone of hip-hop, mm -hmm. okay? The second thing to form in, in hip-hop was the music. The first thing is DJ. I mean, uh, uh, graffiti. The second thing was the DJ. Because mm -hmm. without the DJ, there's no MC. Without the DJ, there's no dancers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, that's the part that people have forgotten. So initially, the DJ was the start. It was Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Mm. It was DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. That's right. That's right. The DJ was the star. Mm. The MC is was was the you know basically 
the hype man, if, that's what, if you want to call it that. Gotcha. See, and as I had explained to other people, where people have missed the, uh, have missed or forgotten or don't understand, mm-hmm. is hip hop can exist without the rapper, but the but the rapper cannot exist without the DJ. Mm. Because, and I say that this way, no matter how dope of an MC you may claim to be. Mm-hmm. On any aspect of this, no matter how dope a lyricist you may be, to this day, there's never been a gold, platinum, or diamond record for an, on an acapella record. You're right. <laughs> okay. You're right. <laughs> but if you look at it from the people, every record has to have music, and somebody has to play that music, be it on radio, be it in the club, be it wherever. Somebody has to play it. That's right. <laughs> so the DJ is essential. To the to hip hop, yeah, it's, it's they're the lifeline. They're definitely the lifeline. Do you feel that they're doing their job? I feel, from my from my viewpoint, mm-hmm. especially in Atlanta, since this is now the mecca of hip hop, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the, that they have forgotten their role. Okay. Everybody wants to get paid and make a living. Okay. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to get paid and make a living. That's a given. Mm-hmm. But I think they've gone too far. In fact, I thought they went too far back in '97 when I, uh, uh, on the record I did with Sammy Sam. Okay. I'm selling records in the streets, if you want to call it that way, or out the trunk, or however you want to put it, right? Mm-hmm. On a level that's, I want to put it this way: I sold 10,000 units. Period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> without radio play. Whoa. Without club play. <laughs> okay. Without any other things that you would think you would need to do. But that's mm-hmm. also because I know how to promote. Mm-hmm. But outside of that fact, when I would go to DJs, mm-hmm. they would literally, they would tell me point blank, I got a record that's hot. Only thing I want you to do is get it harder by playing it. Mm-hmm. And they'd be like, you ain't coming here. You ain't coming in here, talk, you know, bringing me no, no, uh, uh, anything to drink or smoke. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, dude, you ain't, you ain't, you know, basically, they're basically they telling me I'm not caking them up. That's the best way I can put it. I'm not doing things that's, that will help them. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Well, well so, DJ, DJ Paulo, what we're going to do right now, I have to end this particular oh. show in part two. Please stay tuned for part two because I definitely want to get into uh, Mr. DJ, Outcast's DJ, um, okay. and, and, and definitely the hip-hop history of Atlanta. So what we're going to do is we're going to end this show. This is part one with DJ Power Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to Turning Music Into Money, Should I Pay the DJ Edition. Stay tuned for part two.